autopsy, obviously they're not expecting her to live. So we were processing that new information and we actually started to feel rather comfortable with that idea because we didn't know how to take care of her and we didn't know how much she would suffer. We began to think maybe that's the best thing that could happen. We were expecting a phone call from the doctor, but instead of a phone call, we actually got the doctor in person. And he walked in with a smile on his face and he said, if I'd known her heart looked that good, I wouldn't have done anything. And he sat down and he drew me a picture of her heart and he told us that a valve that normally closes when a baby is born hadn't closed yet, but that usually they close by the time they're a year old. That she was still having trouble breathing and she had jaundice, so much for the olive skin. <laughs> so she needed to stay in intensive care at Primary Children's Hospital until they felt like she was stable enough to go home. Well, that night, we decided there's no point me staying in the hospital for the three days that were allowed by insurance back then. We didn't have drive-by deliveries back then the way they do nowadays. We were actually allowed to stay in the hospital for three days. But I couldn't really see any point staying in the hospital because my baby wasn't there with me. And all I wanted to do was go to Primary Children's Hospital and see her. So the next morning, Terry picked me up. I got gathered up all my things, and it was hospital policy for me to sit in a wheelchair. As I was being wheeled out, that was such a sad time. Because when I was pregnant, I kept imagining that special, magical day when we would be leaving the hospital with our new baby and she would have the new outfit on that I crocheted while I was pregnant. The only thing I've ever crocheted in my life. <laughs> and I would wrap her in the blanket that was tied at my baby shower. It was going to be such a wonderful day. But instead, I was leaving the hospital empty-handed. I couldn't wait to get to Primary Children's Hospital. When we arrived, we had to scrub up to go into intensive care. And as soon as we walked in, I could see Heather in her little isolate helping her breathe. She looked so small, so helpless. But in the isolate, next to Heather, was another baby. Only that baby didn't have any arms. And that baby didn't have any legs. It just had little flippers in its shoulders and at its hips. And the parents were our age, and this was their first child. And there was no explanation and no reason why their child was born that way. And for the first time, I had the most profound experience of appreciating what I have, focusing on what I have, not on what I don't have. My baby had arms, and my baby had legs. They were little arms, but they were arms, and I appreciated that. When I went home that night, it was a very sad time, because I went home to the empty nursery with no baby. And when I laid on my back, and my stomach was flat, I felt an intense loneliness and emptiness. I couldn't wait to get back to the hospital the next day. And that's where I spent every day from the minute I got up and got dressed and arrived till they pretty much kicked us out at night. Let, holding Heather as much as they would allow me to hold her. I couldn't wait to take her home and be her mother. But they were worried because she wasn't getting enough nutrition because of her cleft palate. The formula, she just wasn't getting enough. So they told me if I wanted to take her home, I would have to learn how to tube feed her. I was scared, but I wanted to take her home. So I learned how to tube feed her, so I took Heather home. Luckily, I didn't have to tube feed her because a nurse had brought me a lamb's nipple, which is about three inches long 
and I'd put that on the end of the bread feeder instead of the tube. And I'd squeeze the ball, and it would squirt the milk down her throat. And I literally sat in that rocking chair most hours of every day, just feeding Heather. So I got pretty hooked on all the soap operas that were playing at that time. <laughs> So it came time to go to one of our first big doctor appointments because they closed the soft palate at six weeks old. She'd been in the hospital two weeks. So we were going to that doctor pretty early on after I got her home. So I was waiting for the plastic surgeon to walk into the office where I was waiting. And in he came. And the first thing he said was, what's her problem? And I said, well, the doctors think she has a syndrome called Treacher Collins. And he said, well, that's not her only problem. And he said, did you and your husband do drugs? And of course I'd been asked questions about our habits before we got pregnant, but I'd never been asked that question like that before. He went on to tell me about the surgery. I don't think I heard very much. I was way too upset. As soon as I left his office, and got into the safety of my car, I burst into tears. The cold, harsh reality of what I was facing and the cold clinical nature of that doctor was just too much for me to bear. So I went home and I got on the phone and I called the office and I said, I don't want that doctor to do surgery on my baby. And I asked for his associate. So his associate did the surgery. Terry, their dad, spent the night with Heather, and I came up first thing in the morning, 6 a.m., so that I could meet with the doctor and hear the latest news about her progression. So when I got there at 6 o'clock in the morning, in walks Mr. Wonderful. I was trapped. I had to deal with him. That doctor was the one that was doing rounds at 6 a.m. every morning. However, I experienced another side of him, the compassionate side, the caring side, the side that probably was the reason why he became a doctor in the first place, because he was really committed to healing people. And I got to really like that doctor, plus he was funny, he made me laugh. I really liked that side of him. Yes, sometimes he could be sarcastic, and I don't really like sarcasm much, but I really like that doctor. When Heather was about a year and a half old, I got a phone call from the geneticist. He said, come to my office. I'd like to discuss something with you. So we went to his office, and he said, we don't think she has Treacher Collins. We think she has a syndrome called postaxial acrofacial dysostosis. Thank heavens it's called Miller Syndrome now. And he said, there's only three cases that have been reported in medical literature. And the good news is, we believe it's a spontaneous mutation. The cells just started dividing, and they continued, and this is what we got. And it won't happen again. In fact, the chances of it happening again are even less for you than it would be for someone else, because it already happened once, kind of like being struck by lightning, I guess. Well, I was happy to hear that because I wanted to have another baby. So about a year later, I decided that it was time to get pregnant. I thought it would be better to have a boy than a girl because I was worried that Heather would have, if I had a girl, she would have a little sister that could do things she couldn't do and she'd compare herself all the time. So when I found a magazine that gave instructions on what to do to have a boy, I decided to follow the instructions, and I guess it worked. <laughs> that pregnancy went along normally. Later in the pregnancy, I just felt like I wanted to be prepared. Even though there was no reason to think that this baby would have any problems at all, based on what I was told by the geneticist, I still wanted to be prepared. I didn't want to wait until I was in the delivery room to find out. So I had an ultrasound done and was relieved to hear that I was pregnant with a healthy baby girl. <laughs> so when the time came, I went into labor, and it just so happens it was April Fool's Day. 
So when we drove Heather to my mom's house, my little brother said, hey, you should play a joke on people and say you had a baby just like Heather. And, I said, and then say April Fool's. And I said, oh, that wouldn't be very nice. So we went to the hospital. And I'll tell you, being wheeled into that delivery room, and once I was settled in ready for the birth, you definitely could have heard a pin drop in that operating room because it was the same doctor that delivered Heather, Terry, me, and one nurse and all of us were in suspense. Even though there was no reason to think there would be any problems. So Logan's head crowned, and the doctor helped him out of my body and said, you have a boy. And it was the same bent arms. It was unbelievable. Terry said, son of a... <laughs> It was just indescribable how unreal it was to see the same arms. Well, I was worried about the cleft palate part because I really wanted to nurse. I heard the weight falls off much faster than nurse. <laughs> and I'd made a great big cape and applicate a sign on it that said, out to lunch. And I was going to wear it when I nursed in public. I had it all figured out. So I said to the doctor, does he have a cleft palate too? And he said, yeah, he has a cleft palate too. Darn. So they took Logan away because he was having some trouble breathing and they wheeled me into recovery. And the pediatrician came in and he slapped me on the leg and he said, congratulations, you just made medical history. I don't remember being offended by that. But when people hear that he said that, they do wonder. I asked him if I could hold Logan. And he said only for a minute because Logan was having some trouble breathing. So I held Logan for a few minutes and was just filled with love for my new baby boy. And then they took him away. They were able to keep him in that hospital, even though he was having trouble breathing and they weren't really sure why. And I decided I'd stay in the hospital for three days since my baby was there and I had someone taking care of Heather at home. Because we'd had Heather for three years and we loved her a lot and we certainly knew a lot more and she was on her age level in everything that she was being tested for by a health nurse that came to our home every month to see if she was progressing the way she should be. It removed some of my fears. My greatest fear was that he might not live and I desperately wanted him to live. Finally, I went home, but we had to leave Logan at the hospital, so he was there two weeks. So the day came for us to pick Logan up, and I didn't want Heather to be jealous, so I bought her a rubber baby doll, one that could get wet. So basically, she could take care of her baby and do anything with her baby that I was doing with Logan. So at the hospital, Terry placed Logan in my arms and Heather's new baby in her arms. So we all went home together to start our life as a bigger family. Logan was having trouble with the lamb, and within a week, I had to rush him back to the hospital because he'd aspirated on the formula and now had aspiration pneumonia. And it scared both of us. It was intense and scary and upsetting. So when he was well enough, I brought him home and committed to two feeding Logan, which I did for six months because I didn't want that to happen again. Well, here came time for that first appointment again. Got to go see the plastic surgeon about the cleft palate. I couldn't wait to show him Logan, because I knew he had a sense of humor, and I knew he could be really blunt and dry and clinical. But now that I was familiar with it, I was actually curious to see what he was going to say. So when he walked in the office, he said, you got fixed, didn't you? And I said, well, I didn't, but their dad did. And he said, well, maybe you should get fixed, too, so this doesn't happen again. And then he leaned his head out the door and he said, come here. You guys got to see this. It's like two peas out of the same pod. So our life began with doctors and surgeries and a different life than that American dream that we dreamed about. So. The rest of the story is a long story. I wrote a book called Eight Fingers and Eight Toes. 